Hello again. We're going to go ahead into the next portion of our program and bring up our two speakers, both Brian and Ramesh are coming up to speak and they're from salesforce.com. Please welcome them. Yeah, thank you. I think we're good. So thank you very much for having us, Ken, especially to you. Um, congratulations to all the uh, nominees. My name's Romesh Fernando. I, I work at Salesforce, uh, as you can see here, and my colleague Brian. And we are here to talk to you about innovation in sales and marketing. Um, so super excited to be here at the inaugural event. Um, and we're just gonna walk you through a few different um, stories um, about innovation uh, in different companies. Um, and we're gonna touch on a few different things, mobile strategies, artificial intelligence, bots, super, super technical things, and then also um, not so technical things at all and where humans are interacting with, um, with technology to make customer experiences far better. Um, and we, our intention here is that you would learn a few things and maybe um, sort of think about a few things that we share with you and maybe take it back to, to the companies that, and organizations that you work with. So again, thank you for having us. Let's see here. Clicker on. Am I on here? <laughs> I think I'm on. There we go. So we're just going to start you off the slide to a, a few things to kind of set the stage and have you uh, ruminate a little bit. So the silence is intentional. Um, these are statements that might not normally come to mind. Um, I know they created some conflict when we were thinking through them when we were doing our research. And they probably create some room for healthy discussion within organizations. Some people may see these and disagree with them. Our intent uh, today is to kind of talk through the question that this led us to, which is how companies can embrace innovation, right? How you can foster community and how you can become better brand stewards. So when you think of these topics, it's not about handing over the keys when it comes to being a brand steward. It's about how you let your customers help co-own the brand with you, right? It's how you embrace innovation in order to make your customers feel like they're a part of that community. And we have a great privilege of being at Salesforce of being part of a company that embraces that. So we get to see it across a lot of different customers, across a lot of different organizations that aren't even customers. And so one common thread we found when we were doing our research in this particular topic was a common theme, three themes in fact, that the companies that were doing it right um, hit generally everyone on the head and ones that missed the boat had pretty severe impact. So we're gonna cover a few slides where it's gonna talk about the idea of the companies that have done this well and what the result has been. And then we're gonna look at what it looks like if you fail to embrace innovation. So some of the themes we saw was the ability to connect with customers in the way they wanna be connected with. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in or what um, vertical you're in, your customers prefer to be connected in a certain way. And with technology going the way it is, it may not be what's traditional for you and your business. Um, they also collaborate or they, they allow their customers to co-own the brand and build communities. So we're gonna go in a bit to, about how companies have done that. And finally, they build trust. Trust is a huge one when it comes to repeat business and brand loyalty. So all these can kind of be woven together um, and we're gonna walk you through a few examples of where we've seen this. Just by um, a show of hands, how many actually use Salesforce or maybe have used Salesforce in the past? Um, great, looks like a, a good majority here. So for, for, for those of you who um, aren't too familiar with Salesforce and sort of you know, why we're, we were even chosen to kind of give the keynote today, um, Two quick stats about us um, that, are, that are sort of interesting. One is where our customer list is roughly around 200,000 now. So we have 200,000 customers of which, I can't remember the stat, it's like 90% of the Fortune 500 are using Salesforce. Um, and Brian and I, we're, we're located here in, in Irvine in, in Southern California, and we're able to go out and meet with a lot of these customers and understand what they're doing from a sales and marketing standpoint. Um, and really, beyond sales and marketing and into service um, and really the, the kind of whole customer life cycle. Um, and it gives us a unique perspective on those companies who are doing it well and those companies who are, quite frankly, getting, um, getting left behind. Um, so we're gonna talk to you about a few different 
um, stories, not all of which are actually Salesforce customers. A couple of them do use Salesforce products. Um, but we, we, we find them interesting and, and again, things for, for maybe you to kind of consider and potentially take back to, to your organization. So I'll give you a second to just read that quote there, um, which is from, uh, I can't remember if it was a CEO, I think it was a CEO of T-Mobile, someone in the C-suite um, who was sharing what their kind of strategy is as they think about the customer experience uh, with their customer. Can you read it to us? Sure. Um, it, it's too that, small a font. It's that, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to. I won't, I won't ask why, but I'll just read it for you. <laughs> our, our app lets you text a real live human so you can ask questions. There's no listening to options while soft jazz plays in the background. We're among the first companies to offer a chat bot in Facebook Messenger too, but it's always backed up by a human where needed. So we start you off with a very tech forward company, right? Um, but the point here is that as Ken mentioned at the, during his, um, his opening remarks, um, not all of you are tech companies, and that's awesome. There's a conglomeration of all sorts of different companies here. Um, T-Mobile happens to be very tech forward. But having said that, they also have a huge component um, as part of their customer experience. So when someone has an issue with their T-Mobile phone or their T-Mobile plan, they can text in. Um, and someone on the other end, a customer support personnel, is able to respond back. So they're able to support that, uh, that channel. So there's, you know, there's, there's phone, there's email, there's text, there's chat, there's portals. T-Mobile is supporting the text channel um, live with a, with a human on the other end. But in the case of the chat bot uh, in Facebook Messenger, what they're actually doing is, if, if you're not familiar with the chat bot, um, the idea is that you chat in and you say, hey, I've got an issue with maybe my T-Mobile subscription. Um, and a computer is actually responding to your question. Um, in the case of a simple, a simple question like, hey, what is my account number? The computer might be able to actually answer back and you never interact with a human. But in the case of maybe something a little bit more elaborate like, I'm not having great connectivity when I'm at home, but my phone works at, in the office, that sort of thing. You actually want sort of a blend, a blend of technology and that human component. And T-Mobile is meeting their customers uh, where, they, where they're asking to be met at. We're actually going uh, to, at the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll take a, just a couple of minutes. If anyone has any questions or comments, we're happy to, to take those. So T-Mobile is a great example of a tech forward company. But a great example that I'd like to kind of talk through is Dunkin' Donuts, right? So when you think of Dunkin' Donuts, what do you think of? I know for me and my family, uh, we have a tradition every Sunday morning where we go and get donuts. Um, I created the, the tradition, but my seven and nine-year-old appreciate it. Um, in fact, I, I, I was going through this presentation with them, and my son, who's seven, at, when I ended, he said, I have some feedback. And he said, um, can we get donuts for dessert? And I said, that's not the feedback I was looking for. But the point here is, I think of them as a donut company, right? And I think most people would. I go to Dunkin' Donuts on Sunday morning. I grab a donut and coffee. Both are really good. I leave, and that's the end of my experience. That's not what Dunkin' Donuts wanted to be thought of as. And that's not kind of how they wanted to build their brand around their customers. They actually are more of a tech company. And I'm not sure how many of you would have thought of that when you thought of Dunkin' Donuts. But something that they have done to set themselves apart in an industry where most are brick and mortar mom and pop brand shops where you can't even pay with anything but cash, um, they have gone and built an app. They've built an experience around this idea of being a donut company, right? And they want you to leave Dunkin' Donuts and take that experience with you. The end result of this, their goal, is to build referrals, build brand loyalty, stay connected with their customer. In fact, they went as far as to hire a chief innovative officer. I've worked for companies that didn't even have that and they were tech companies, right? So this really changes your concept of, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, it doesn't matter what business you're working for, you still have customers that are living in the same world as everyone else and they wanna be communicated with 
in their own medium. They want to be part of a community. And this has led to over 15 million Facebook fans. They have a tagline that says, America runs on Duncan, but if you go to Facebook, it says, and Duncan runs on you. And they've really embraced this concept of, hey, you co-own our brand with us. Without you, we're nothing. We don't have a business. And it's led to a lot of brand loyalty, as opposed to some of these other donut shops you might just drive on by, or Krispy Kremes, which was, has half the fans, right, that hasn't embraced it. And our, our challenge to you is, regardless of the industry you're in, uh, regardless of the vertical, uh, in, a, in a way, regardless of your customer, um, thinking about yourselves as a tech company, whether you're uh, in executive search, or you're in healthcare, or whatever it might be, here we are with a donut company. I mean, there's nothing more sort of brick and mortar about a customer like this. You walk into the store, you buy a product, and you leave. Um, but they're really sort of asserting themselves as, in fact, a tech company. Um, they're also a brick and mortar company, but they're also a tech company. And so there's that sort of blend uh, when, as they kind of go to market. So here's a, um, another example. Um, when we think of REI, we think of a number of things, right? So uh, we probably think about camping, and we think about hiking, and we think about the outdoors, we think about adventure. Uh, in fact, my family and I just did a camping trip two weekends ago at Palomar Mountain. Um, on the way down um, from Irvine today, we were passing the Palomar area, and I was reminded of that. And that's, I, I'd gone to REI and bought a headlamp for my kids um, to be able to see while, uh, you know, it's at nighttime. And that's what you think about with REI. That's their, that's their brand. That's their messaging. Outdoors, adventure, and unplugged. Well, would you be surprised to know that they have a 350-person IT team? So REI, the outdoor company, has 350 people who are thinking about, what are they thinking about? What is an IT team thinking about? They're thinking about the not one, not two, not three, but eight mobile apps that REI has. Right? So REI has eight mobile apps. One of the apps is to, um, for hikers, when they're out hiking, to be able to share a route with other hikers and say, hey, this route um, is the best route up the mountain. This one has the least obstacles, things like that. So one of eight apps. Um, they also have a customer insights team and a digital division. So they are very much a outdoorsy um, brand, obviously. That's where you go. Again, another brick and mortar type um, outfit, similar to Dunkin' Donuts. Um, but at the same time, they're a tech company. Um, and that's how they think of themselves. Having said all of that, I think it's really interesting to share this. You might so, want to read it for him. But yeah. <laughs> I'm Just not saying. Even sure. <laughs> I'm not even sure I can read this one. Um, but That's fair. You can read the, the, big, the big print, which is <laughs> REI is closing on Black Friday. So when you think about building trust with a company, um, building, a tr building trust with a customer, Think about REI closing all of their stores, all of their outlets across the country on the biggest um, sales day of the year, the biggest consumer product um, sales day of the year. Everyone's familiar with Black Friday. The reason it's called Black Friday is because many retailers are in the red up until November. And then in November, they go in the black. And then we come into the holiday season. And that's when they make um, huge amounts of sales and huge amount of profit. REI went back to their, they don't even call them customers, they call them members, because REI is a co-op. Um, and they said, you know what? We're getting back to our roots, and we're closing all of our stores on the biggest day of the year, and we're asking you as members to go out and do exactly what we're about, which is get, get to the outdoors, go on an adventure, take your kids camping, go hiking, um, and I think that's really compelling when you think about, yes, they're connecting with their customers on mobile apps. Yes, they're collaborating with their, their members. Um, but also, at the same time, they're building trust. Um, and that's so important, especially in, in the times that we live in now, which we'll, we'll actually share with you in, in a moment. 
some companies, as Brian mentioned before, that haven't built trust with their, with their customers, and they're not connecting, and they're not collaborating. And, and what does that mean for, for those businesses? So a final example we'll, we'll talk about. I'm getting stuck with donuts and coffee today, so recurring theme. So <laughs> you can guess I like coffee. So Starbucks, uh, 2008. Well, let's back up. 2007, I was newly married. We went up to San Francisco to start a franchise, home improvement, window coverings, blinds, epoxy flooring, and I promised my wife millions and we're going to be good. 2008, and uh, I did not deliver on that promise, and I got into a different industry. Um, but Starbucks chose to look at the challenge and say, how are we going to embrace innovation in a time when people are losing market share, losing customers, losing loyalty? And they came out with this idea of the Starbucks Idea Exchange. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but you can go on their website, you can share an idea, you can comment on ideas, you can vote on ideas, and they have product managers on the back end who are collecting all this data, and they're deciding what the roadmap looks like, and they're actually building that feedback into their roadmap. So a few things that I learned in, in my research on Starbucks that were interesting that came out of the Idea Exchange was the cake pop, which is my daughter's favorite, the splash stick, which is my favorite, because I don't have coffee on my front, and then uh, free Wi-Fi, and uh, what was it, a free birthday treat. So those are just four of the hundred ideas that they've adopted from their customers. So this goes to show us what it looks like when you put the keys in your customer's hand and let them help co-own the brand with you. And it took them out of a time that not only could have hurt their market share and hurt their customers repeat business and it actually built brand loyalty. Um, another thing that they did that they embraced from an innovation perspective is apps. So I don't know about you, but for me, I used to travel a lot more than I do now. And whenever I would go to New York or Seattle or wherever it was I was going, I needed coffee before my meeting because I would take a red eye. And I would just grab the closest coffee to me, even if it was an airplane coffee. Um, but then I started using the Starbucks app, and I found that over the course of about a year, I became a very loyal customer. And ironically, my wife would tell you, I don't even think their coffee's the best. Um, but they're convenient, and they connected with me in a way that was convenient. So I love the fact that I can find the closest store. I love the fact that I can place an order before I get there. I love the fact that I get free drinks if I place enough on my company card. And I love the fact that I don't have to worry about where my next cup of coffee is, right? So they really connected with me in a way that I, nowadays, I literally look for the closest Starbucks. When I'm driving between San Diego and LA, I'll pull up the app and I'll, I'll pull off at a Starbucks. Um, so that was kind of a, a takeaway. And then... Um, I'll, I'll add one thing to that. Yeah. Um, for those of you who haven't used the Starbucks app, um, the way it works is you, you order on, on your phone, you order on the app, and you walk into the store and the coffee is waiting for you. you don't, you've already paid, so the coffee is just up on the counter, you grab it and you go. Well, with this idea exchange, the way that idea exchange actually works is customers submit ideas, sure, as, as Brian shared, but also what happens is other customers can vote on those ideas. Um, and when they vote on those ideas, they're, they're scored. And so now if you have five customers voting for an idea, that equals, say, 10 points. If you have 10 customers voting on that idea, now it's up to, say, 20 points. And what the product managers at Starbucks do is they look at the ideas that have the most points because their customers have voted on those ideas, mm -hmm. and then they look to implement those ideas. It's very collaborative with their customers and their internal um, product team. And it's just very uh, an interesting way to sort of go to market. So they take their customer voice, they think about what their customers are saying and asking for, and then they come back and go to market with the strategy. Yeah, and the final yeah. thing it, it we'll leave you with on Starbucks is, if you look at a bunch of case studies done on them, is it helped them rebuild brand trust? And so that was the whole focus for them along the way was how can we maintain brand trust, integrity, and repeat business. Um, and this was kind of what led the charge from an innovations perspective. So With um, that, we'll jump into the next one. So sure. there's examples of customers that haven't connected or haven't listened. And a classic one that I'd like to point to, the first one on the next slide, is JCPenney. So you think of JCPenney and you think about a business, 
Um, they used to be the only place I went as a kid, and my grandma would always order my Christmas presents from JCPenney, which maybe it's not the first, it's like the fourth. There you go. Um, <laughs> got my numbers off. But this one was interesting to me in our research because um, the reason, I don't know if a lot of people know the story behind it, but the reason they lost touch was because they lost um, the connection with their customers. So they saw a lot of success in the middle kind of middle income bracket of America and thought, we're going to move up stack. We're going to try to be Nordstrom. And in doing that, they didn't connect with the, the high income customer. And they tried to go back down stack after they listened to their customer and lost both. So it's really a telling story around this concept of if you're not connecting, if you're not listening, and if you're not um, collaborating with your customers, then it can have a, a very dramatic impact on your business. Now that's a, a kind of an extreme use case, but. Yeah, but it's, it's a great one, because, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, you're chuckling, because Equifax, because it's the most recent one, right? Um, but I'll keep going here, and maybe you'll continue chuckling, because there's Uber also, right? Uber's lost a lot of trust with their customers for a variety of reasons, not the least of which their, their founder and CEO was basically pushed out. Um, and they're having trouble with lawsuits and, uh, as I mentioned, just a, a variety of use cases. United Airlines, another one, right? Everyone's got a camera in their pocket these days. And you have to be really um, sort of uh, attuned to the, the customer experience. They're not, and they're suffering. Their brand is suffering, right? We have VW. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that sort of use case, um, they got caught with uh, a, a concern regarding emissions and essentially lying to the industry, lying to their customers. Um, and what happens with that? What happens when you lose that trust with your customer? What happens when you're no longer connecting, no longer collaborating with your customer? This is what happens. So I'll, I'll draw your attention actually to that second number. There's a bunch up there, but $30 billion the amount VW will pay um, in fines and repairs for cheating diesel admissions, right? That's just fines and repairs. Um, what this slide doesn't call out is how much damage are they um, undergoing sales-wise um, with regards to their brand. So their brand has been damaged. How many people are now thinking, hmm, maybe I'll choose a different brand um, because of essentially being lied to? Right? So it's something that, that we like to think about because those first few stories, I think there was three or four stories, um, are about customers doing it right. And these last few are about what happens when you don't think about connecting, when you don't think about collaborating, when you, when you don't think about building trust. So with that, we want to leave you with some thoughts to take back to the office, more or less questions that I'll make sure to read through um, if we want to pull those up. <laughs> Do we truly understand and connect with our customers, right? Do we understand how they want to be connected with, like the Starbucks, like the REI? There's more to it than just the medium you connect with them. It's also connecting them with them in a way that is true to your business and not selling out on what your business is about and blending those two. The second is, are we a brand steward? Are we letting our customers co-own the brand with us and feel a sense of community? And that can be in a lot of different ways. I know for us, we see a lot of customers and companies that are putting up communities that are gamifying it, that are making it more interactive and allowing the customer to feel like they're a part of a family and less of a customer. Third is, do our customers trust us? Are we operating in a way that's always putting our best foot forward? It seems obvious, but like Ramesh said, you don't know who can catch what and what goes on social media. And so it's always being aware of that in every step of the way. And finally, um, are we internally discussing these topics of how we can be more connected, collaborative, and trusted? Um, so hopefully you can take these back and it creates some food for thought, things to discuss within the office of how we can embrace this better as businesses. And with that, we want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening. Yeah.